I think we're live. Our next clinician has been digging in the archives for us to get a look at the New Haven STEAM for modelers. And even if you don't model the New Haven, we know you're going to learn something STEAMy you can use from this clinic, the great Randy Hamill. Thanks for the introduction there. Um, hi, I'm Randy. Uh, you may remember me from uh, about a month ago, I guess we did one of these, uh, just talking about New Britain Station. This is a clinic that uh, Chris Adams and I put together uh, with some help from Charlie Dunn uh, and the, the New Haven Historical uh, Association um, photo library. Chris is the photo librarian. And so uh, usually Chris and I have done this together, but uh, I'll go ahead and run it through today uh, myself. Um, it's largely just a slideshow to uh, kind of show the different details and things to look at when you're modeling STEAM. Uh, the same you know, process will be appropriate for whether you're doing freight cars, diesels, even structures. Um, it's just a, a, a good way to look around, uh, you know, look at photographs and, and see how you're going to um, go ahead and model something. Uh, so it, this is covering New Haven STEAM, obviously. This is something that uh, uh, I'm modeling. I, I actually haven't gotten around to doing much of my steam locomotives yet, uh, but uh, I think it's a, a good introduction for steam for, for anybody. So I'm going to get through it because it is going to be kind of long, and I'll go through the slides pretty quickly, but you'll be able to go back and pause them later on um, so that you can get better look at any you want to. Uh, the other thing I should mention is you can go to my uh, blog, blog.newbritainstation.com. And there's a bunch of handouts for this. The clinic will be on there minus most of the pictures, uh, but also some extra information about uh, resources for finding photos online or in publications for New Haven STEAM, uh, detail parts, available models in HON or O, uh, o scale, um, as well as some specific documents about uh, modeling an R1B locomotive. Um, so let's get started here. This clinic is covering uh, just classes that are easy to model. Uh, so basically, these are classes that have models available. Most are in brass. Uh, most are out of production, but they're pretty easy and, and reasonable uh, on eBay or shows and so on. Um, this is an example of the sort of thing that I would do uh, for a more complex project like this, where I will highlight... Um, parts that are unique or might be different on different locomotives or things that I want to be able to add. And, and essentially, these are typically things that are not present on the existing model. So this is what I would need to do to make modifications for this particular uh, locomotive uh, and start looking for parts and all. So that's kind of what I recommend um, you kind of dig through the photos and that's kind of the purpose of these. So you can look at photos for different locomotives and compare them to the models that you've got and see how you want to uh, modify it. We'll all kind of have our own level of skill as well as what's important to us when modeling. Um, for many of us, you know, minor placement details of certain parts or stuff may not be enough to warrant making these changes. Uh, but this is kind of the, the approach that I use. Um, so the New Haven made a bunch of modifications to their steam over the years. This is typical of most uh, railroads. Some common ones were the headlights. They started off with oil headlights. Um, and then in the late teens, they started switching to these cylindrical or can type headlights. I believe they were made by Pile National. But kind of the signature one on the New Haven is this ESCO Golden Glow headlight. Um, these started applying them in around 1926. They used them on uh, steam, they use them on electrics. Um, and they're one of those things that stands out as something uniquely New Haven. Uh, I'm sure other railroads did use them, but Pile National was more common. The spotting feature of the uh, the Golden Glow headlight is that the hinge is on the top instead of the side like it is on the Pile National. So it is something you can kind of spot pretty easily once you know what you're looking for. Um, other changes made over the years, things like the pilots, they used to be made out of po uh, boiler tubes like the originals here. Uh, they would apply pilot plows when needed, uh, obviously switchers and some local uh, locomotives for local freights would have footboards. And then um, 
late 30s, they started applying uh, these steel strap pilots and replacing the old boiler tube ones. Uh, and they would use pilot plows for those occasionally as well. Um, other changes that were made, the tenders were very commonly uh, changed. Um, the New Haven swapped tenders early on because of um, issues with their original purchases. So when they purchased the R1B mountains or the R1 mountains and the uh, I-4 Pacifics, uh, they wanted some longer tenders, but the uh, turntables were insufficient uh, size to fit those locomotives. So large tenders were purchased later on on switchers, you'll see in a little while. And for primarily the shoreline service, they were trying to eliminate some of the water stops to uh, speed up the schedules. And so they would swap those out later on when the turntables were extended. Um, they also changed the tender classes and the appearance. Obviously, when stokers were installed, uh, they received coal bunker extensions. And um, after World War II, as things were retired, they were swapped uh, quite frequently. Larger tenders were moved to uh, other locomotives um, at the time. Uh, so there's a list here of a bunch of tender classes uh, that you can look at on your own time. It'll be in the Clinica handout as well, so you can see that. Uh, Vanderbilt tenders were not that common on the New Haven. They uh, only had, uh, I think there were 12 of them, if I recall. Um, they only had two of the V1As and the different spotting features, basically the V1A has a longer coal bunker side here. It comes down further towards the frame. There's some minor differences. There's a ladder that you can't really see here on the back that's not on the V2. Uh, the two V1As were purchased to go on I-4 classes, which were passenger locomotives for the Merchants Limited. Um, and the rest of the ones were for the R2 and R1Bs uh, for the high-speed freights on the shoreline as well. Um, and so that's why they purchased these. Uh, they were switched to those. Uh, and the, the, um, only those two I-4s uh, carried the uh, – there were a couple that got them when they were in service, for example. But it was only on the merchants that used it, and it was for about a decade that it was in that service. Um, and as you'll see, there's uh, a number of uh, locomotives that we've documented over the years receiving those tenders as they got swapped around. So getting into switchers to start with, um, the small switchers were typically all 060s, the T2 classes. Um, the T2B was released by Overland Brass. This is uh, an example of one, and we'll go through a bunch. Basically, what you're going to see on these is that... Um, some signature features on the New Haven. Uh, so there's the, this one already has the golden glow headlight. Um, they also, a lot of the New Haven uh, locomotives had arched cab windows. In this case, it's a straight cab window, but they do have an angled uh, frame on the window itself. We'll see some differences there. Um, some other differences you'll see on the T2 classes. If you look at specific locomotives, this has two single uh, air, uh, air pumps instead of a cross compound pump. Um, they've run the running board up and over it. Um, the dynamo is up here. Sometimes they, that location is different from locomotive uh, to locomotive in the T2 uh, classes. Um, this is a T2B, which is what was modeled by Overland. And uh, most of these, I, I'm not sure I have a T2A in here. The main difference was the T2A, the side rod was connected to the second driver instead of the first. Um, and as we go through the slideshow, these are in uh, road number order. So they jump back and forth uh, by era, but you'll see this one has the dynamo back by the cab, a cross compound pump. The running board is straight instead of up and over the pump. Uh, it still has the old can um, headlight. So, and as we go through some of these, this one is out of service. The locomotive, uh, the stack is capped there, as you can see. But these are the most common switchers at small yards. And uh, unless you're modeling one of the large yards, this is the locomotive you're going to look for um, for your layout. Uh, and you'll see sometimes the piping changes from one to another. Uh, some of these will have uh, a power reverse, some do not. Um, this one has this extended coal bunker. Um, the Overland model actually comes with that extended coal bunker. It's a separate part, uh, but because they don't have the uh, frame that goes around the, the coal bunker sides, it's hard to do the, uh, the initial configuration. So another look at that extended coal bunker. Um, this little thing here is a fire hose. That's the, uh, the water hatch. 
Now, the backup light on this is a can one. This is in New Britain, Connecticut, which is what I'm modeling all this. This was retired before um, the era that I'm modeling. This one has a different coal bunker uh, extension, so it would be easy enough to, to scratch build that to fit inside the, uh, the Overland model. And so uh, this one's out of service. The main rod is actually in the tender up here, and it's been taken off the side here. Uh, so for the bigger switchers, they had uh, initially the Y3 class was the USRA 080. So this is super easy to model because there have been a whole bunch of them released uh, over the years. Um, they did have some things like coal pushers on some of them. Um, these are Vulcan trucks uh, on the tenders. Uh, some of them had uh, Flager trucks on the tenders, um, and some also received arch bar trucks. Otherwise, these were a pretty standard US array with the clear vision tender. So the, the uh, lifelike Proto 2000, now Walther's, is a really great model for, uh, for modeling these. These would have been in slightly larger yards, Waterbury or Hartford, certainly Cedar Hill, Maybrook, that sort of thing um, was where they were used. There's also some photos of them handling local freights on some of the uh, lesser branch lines. So they did get around uh, some. The uh, headlight is the golden glow on that one again. And, you know, as you'll see, these are pretty standard. They did not have a lot of changes made to these switchers. Um, the throttle is a, a short throttle up here. You'll see in a moment that's kind of the big difference between the, uh, the Y4 and the Y3 uh, visually. The Y4, however, mechanically was quite different in that they had a third cylinder. These were a three-cylinder uh, locomotive based off of the USRA 080. Uh, overall, it's a very similar one, but you'll see there's a lot more piping on this one than uh, uh, the original is as, and, and this was mostly like, this is extra um, uh, sand lines here. I'm not even sure what all the piping is for here, but um, a lot of this might've been under the jacket earlier on. And as they got uh, later on, um, they would, uh, move those out. This tender's uh, is still the USRA tender. You can tell the USRA tender has an unusual rivet pattern, and I think you can kind of see it here. There's a couple of vertical panels, and then the rest are three horizontal panels uh, that I don't think I've seen on any other tender than other than the USRA ones. Um, there's also this little structure that comes out of the front of the cylinders. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but that is not on the Y3s. The throttle on this comes all the way out to here, and that's kind of another spotting feature for the Y4 classes. Um, otherwise, they're very similar. So that's a picture of how it came delivered. These came with uh, the um, Vanderbilt tenders, which is a really unique look for an 080 switcher. Um, they had them for a couple of years, I guess, while they were expanding the, or lengthening the turntables before they moved them to the R1s and the uh, I4s. But otherwise, they, they retained their appearance for a, a good amount of time. They didn't have really a lot of significant changes for these classes. Uh, as we will find later on, uh, the New Haven had the tendency to make a lot of changes to their locomotives. And these are from a, a variety of years, like I said. So you, this gives you kind of a good view of this little portion of the appliance. Uh, I don't know really what that is there, but uh, that is something that uh, you'd want to do. The W and I, I'm sorry, Precision Scale did the uh, the Y4 classes. So the freight classes, the K1 class is the largest on the New Haven. This is your traditional little mogul, small time. Uh, for local freights on any of the branch lines would handle occasional uh, local freights on even the main line, uh, like uh, the shoreline of the Springfield line. Also work trains, they, they were all over the place. Um, here we see they have the arch windows. Not all of them had the arch window. This is the original tender as it was delivered. Um, and uh, other than that, this is pretty uh, good representation of what the K1 class looked like. The K1B class uh, was as they were originally configured and not all of them were modified into K1Ds later on. Um, so even to the end, it was about an even mix between K1Bs and Ds. Um, the air tanks are a little different from one to another. Again, the, uh, the air pumps, 
sometimes the configuration of the handrails, location of other appliances might vary a little bit, but uh, uh, you know those were all upgrades that were done uh, for whatever reason when they were ma doing maintenance on these. You'll see the tenders do switch quite a bit even in this uh, era. So this still has the, uh, the can headlight, but it's already received a different tender. Um, this is the original configuration. So the K1B you can recognize by the steam chest here and all. It's uh, not been superheated yet. And that's kind of the spotting feature. And uh, New England uh, Rail Service replay, uh, re released both the K1B and D models in brass uh, in the 80s. And it's, it's a really well done model. Otherwise, they're just a, a signature class that you pretty much have to have. They were they were the workhorses that did all the work. So this is a K1D. This is superheated. So the cylinders here have been replaced, um, and that's the spotting feature for the K1D versus the K1B. Um, this one is set up for use on the shoreline. Uh, it's in Providence. So this is an ATS, a cab signal box. So it needed that to operate on the shoreline. Uh, the railing here is a, a very interesting stepped railing up here that's been modified. Uh, obviously the uh, running board's been modified and so on for that one. Uh, so these are all, you know, the sort of details that you can uh, customize on your model to, to do a specific road number if you want to. Uh, pretty classic look here, just the, the K1D arched window, um, later tender, this probably would have come from maybe an I1 or I2 at some point. Golden Glow headlight again. Most of the steam started off with spoked pilot trucks uh, or pilot wheels. Then they were replaced with these disc wheels later on, as you can see there. Um, so you'll see that's a little change that's happened. Uh, most of the models come with the, the disc ones. But these are, you know, the ubiquitous local freight. This was this was the, the locomotive that was most often used for that. These did have different types of valve gear too. This is the Baker valve gear. Some did have wall shirts. This had Southern valve gear on this one. Um, uh, on one of the handouts, it does list the ones that we've identified that have the different ones. This is uh, the new Hartford local. This is sitting in Plainville, Connecticut, which is just past New Britain. Uh, and so this is the one that I'll be modeling at some point. And naturally the model is Baker valve gear, but this one never received the Baker valve gear. It stayed with the, uh, the Southern until the end. So for the larger freights, um, the Mikados, the J classes, J1 was the, uh, the predominant one. Um, I'll cover the J2 in just a brief second, but there's uh, the J1 was released in key uh, brass and, and is easy to get. Um, these were more common on the mainline freights, but they did run on the branch lines as well. Um, just where larger locomotives handled heavier tonnage than the uh, um, the other ones. There weren't a whole lot of variations on these either. Uh, the handrails sometimes go over the top of the boiler like on this one. Sometimes they'll end right here. Um, injector pipes and so on were moved outside the jacket. Um, a couple of them had McClellan vo uh, boilers, which was a cast boiler. I don't know if, uh, which required extending the cab. I can't remember if we have a photo of that. Um, and uh, and then some of them, well, they would all swap around tenders over time. A few of them received uh, clear vision tenders, and I'll show you that in a moment as well. But for the most part, these are, um, you know, just the the... The variations are just modifications around the uh, the air pumps or the railings or other small appliances, as well as moving the uh, appliance or the piping outside the jacket. And this one's got a footboard, so it would have been on local service. Um, I think they may have all had footboards, actually. I haven't looked at that in a while. ATS on this. So this, again, sitting in Providence. So this would have been shoreline ATS uh, as opposed for the Springfield line one. Uh, and that was required for any locomotives running on the line. This is very similar to the USRA Mikado, and you could kit bash it from that. There's a, in New Haven Power, um, there's a diagram that, that superimposes the USRA over this. And the main difference is the cab height. New Haven had some low clearances, but the other factor was that um, 
they had the electric zone and so they like to keep the clearance uh down for that in uh, under the catenary um the j1s were interesting a number of them had a, a reddish cab roof i don't know the purpose for that um, i haven't really seen it this is 3022 which is a locomotive that chris adams is modeling uh, because it later on this is in passenger service uh, which is a little bit less common for the j's um, later on it would become the the uh, freight for the uh, airline local so this still has a boiler tube pilot on it it's been replaced by footboards here um, but the main difference is, is it has this clear vision tender now because it's also in local service. Um, and those came off of the J2s. This is a J2 with a picture of that tender. So the J2 was another class of Mikado. These were heavy Mikados. And apparently the main issue was is that they were really too large for a fireman to hand fire. And they never put stokers in them. So most of the time they were on uh, pushing uh cars over the hump in Cedar Hill or uh, Hartford, or they might be in pusher service and stuff like that. And they uh, didn't last very long in road service. Um, so the next class of freight locomotives here would be the L1s. And this is really big, uh, big uh, freight. This was primarily for the Maybrook freights coming over the mountains or the hills, if you're from out west, I guess, um, from Maybrook to Cedar Hill, but they would continue to Boston. Uh, low drivers, so uh, they didn't have the speed of the mountains, but they did. Uh, they could haul the tonnage. And these were interesting because they were uh, really maximized the clearance. The boiler is huge. As you can see, it goes right to the top of the cab. The cab uh, front here is actually angled to provide an, a wide enough opening for the door. And there were rules uh, for when the uh, there's a, a swing out um, window so that you could have a, a kind of a windshield when you're running. And those had to be pulled in at certain locations because the clearances were so tight with these locomotives. Uh, but this really also shows you kind of a signature New Haven look that you're going to see on, on a good number of the classes coming up. The Alesco feed water heater. Um, in this case, the air pumps are up on the pilot. Uh, this was not their original location, but they moved the air pumps up here, and I'll show you why in a moment, but uh, with these shields to protect them from the elements a little bit. Um, and this this look here with the feed water heater and the uh, golden glow headlight and the arch cab window is really kind of very signature New Haven. So this has... Um, shows you we've got a, an air... This is the Alesco feed water pump. Uh, for the feed water system. And then these are the ATS boxes. These would have originally been on the pilot um, and there was a single air pump and they found that was insufficient. So in order to add the second air pump, they moved the air pumps to the uh, the pilot and moved the ATS boxes. So this would be uh, both shoreline and Hartford ATS. So it could run on the Springfield and the shoreline uh, depending on what the need was that day. So the overall appearance of these did not change a whole lot. Um, some interesting things, the sand dome is split here because the uh, clearance, it's, uh, it just couldn't be any taller basically. So it's two smaller ones side by side instead of one large one. Uh, but it really shows the, the size of these. This one has a dog house in the tender. There were a handful of uh, New Haven locomotives that had that as well. Uh, the bell's way up here on the side again, because they're they need to keep the clearance uh, from that. So it's it really maximized the amount of space that these could haul. And, uh, you know, this, especially in the, uh, the uh, electric zone where these were running coming out of Maybrook. This is early on before the pumps were moved forward. So this has the two air pumps, but the feed water heater has not been uh, added yet. So it didn't need to, uh, to move those just yet. but a really muscular looking locomotive. And this kind of shows you a number of the different uh, minor variations between one and another in the different classes, depending on what you want to model, uh, road numbers rather. Um, so the R1 is another signature class. Uh, they had a lot of mountains, these light mountain locomotives. Um, and one of the discussions about the R1 uh, has always been about the Delta trailing truck. Uh, the first 10 that were delivered were USRA locomotives. So they have the standard USRA trailing truck. 
Uh, after that, they uh, the other classes were delivered with trailing, uh, Delta trailing trucks. And as we started looking at photos, we realized that there were actually three different variations over the years of these trailing trucks. Uh, the first one is this really heavy one, and I'm not aware of any parts that are available for that. But the other two, you can get parts. The third truck was used prime, uh, on the R3 classes, which we'll look at in a moment. So for the R classes, um, either the original locomotives, the first 10 you can do is the USRA trailing truck, and then the rest of them would have had, uh, you can model with this trailing truck. And there's actually... Um, fortunate that this is on the, the road numbers that they are uh, for other reasons that you'll see in just a moment here. So this was the first 10 R1 cla uh, class. They were never reclassified as R1B, even when modified. Uh, they received the feed water heaters um, around 28 is when they started adding the Alesco feed water heaters. Um, this has ATS up front here. Uh, and otherwise, this is a pretty much standard USRA uh, light mountain. And so you can use a lot of different uh, models to model that. Does not have, uh, actually, that does look like it's the original USRA tender without the clear vision sides. Um, so feed water pump and the uh, air pump here. These were on the fast freights on the shoreline. Um, in the Springfield line and even occasionally in uh, local freight service in later years. So the spotting feature for these first 10 is that the uh, sand dome is above the first driver. So that's where the USRA one is and that makes it very simple to model. It becomes a little more difficult to model the second group because these have the sand dome move back above the second driver. So in order to take one of the uh, other, to do this group uh, from 3310 to 3334, um, this is really kind of the bigger sticking point. These also have those really heavy uh, Delta trailing trucks. So this group of locomotives is a lot more difficult to model. Um, at this point, because they needed the second air pump, the one was insufficient. They moved the uh, the two up front behind the uh, guards again, just like they did the shields on the uh, the L1s. This has the V1A tender. The uh, coal bunker side is much lower, and so this has received the V1A. And this is kind of a classic look on the New Haven. Uh, the R1s on the shoreline had the, uh, the Vandy tenders. So you've got the feed water heater, Gold glow headlight, the Vandy tender, and the, uh, the the pumps up front here. That's just a very very telltale New Haven uh, locomotive. This still has Southern valve gear. This class, this group of R1Bs were delivered with the uh, Southern valve gear. Many of them received the uh, Baker later on. Um, so a good look at the front and and the way this is all configured up here for the uh, the pumps. It's already received the strap pilot here. Nice broadside shot. This has one of the long haul tenders. Um, so the shoreline had these larger tenders, either the Vandy or these tenders, so that they wouldn't have to make as many water stops. Still the southern valve gear. Pumps has not been moved up front. There's still just the single pump on this one. Uh, this one has actually the same, it's the same locomotive later on. This has now received the Baker valve gear. Um, more uh, sand lines here. The pumps have been moved up front. It has ATS um, and it also has a doghouse on this one. So it's all in these little details. This is kind of what will make a model a little bit more unique if you want to you can make some of these changes and and model something very specific um so it's a little different than just your standard off the shelf model and so i don't know what all of this piping is here uh, but uh you know this has been added as well to some of them so the next group of them 33 35 to 33 39 um also has the sand dome over the second driver. Um, this has southern valve gear on it still. This is the locomotive that I'm going to need to model, and the key did release it with the southern valve gear, which is nice. Uh, and then I got a USRA tender uh, from a, another model. 
this is later on in its life. Now it has more sand lines here. This is pretty much what I'm going to base mine off of. This is uh, kind of the end of life at 47. This ran on a uh, one train from Hartford to Bridgeport um, until the end of 48, and then it was retired. 33, 39 with the Vandy tender again. This is the V1A with the, uh, the lower coal bunker sides. Runs on both uh, Shoreline and Springfield line, it looks like. So the last group of R1Bs uh, switched the sand dome back over the first driver. So this is another group of R1Bs that's really easy to model from any light mountain. And this is the group, uh, there's a handout um, that I provided there that uh, is a document that John Pryke did in 1971 about modeling this class, this group of them using an Akane brass locomotive, but you can use any light mountain uh, for this particular group. And so these were, uh, you know, with the sand dome here, the trailing truck is the one that's available uh, as parts. So you can, you can pretty easily model this particular uh, group of R1Bs. Uh, the Vandy tenders you either get from a key brass one or you can uh, use the BLI Vandy tender that they released on the I-4. So the R3s were uh, New Haven's heavy mountains, and they actually wanted to, they, they tried to classify these as the New Haven type. So um, the Santa Fe type that they had, the L1s, you know, they were hoping that the, uh, the industry would adopt that name for that. These were unique. Uh, I'm not sure anybody else had these. These are a three-cylinder locomotive. So again, it has this on the front. This has something to do with the fact it's a three-cylinder locomotive. The other one's buried under here and all the linkage in the center. Um, these have cast uh, McClellan uh, smoke boxes um, and boilers. So this is a cast smoke box. And the steam lines here are um, all cast into this one part here. These came with the feed water heaters, came with the ATS up front. Uh, they later moved again the air pumps up front for these and you can see that these are just massive locomotives like the uh, the L1s. And these were again, these were really the heavy shoreline freight. So the L1s were pretty much, you know, mostly Maybrook to Cedar Hill. These would have been uh, shoreline trains from Cedar Hill to Boston, for example, uh, and carrying, handling the heavy freights at speed. Uh, so really just massive, massive locomotives. And uh, some of them received these large shields in front of the air pumps. Must have made maintenance rather interesting. It does make for a very unique looking locomotive. Uh, you won't mistake it for kind of anything else, I don't think. Um, the ATS box is up here on the top, which is an interesting placement for it. There's another one. This one's got a doghouse. Shoreline in the Hartford ATS again. And these have been available. Uh, the precision scale one is really well done. Um, Wall shirts valve gear. For New Haven modelers as well, this is kind of a, a an interesting one. John Pryke was a, a really big uh, part of the, the NERSHA, the organization itself, but also a, an amazing modeler. And Scratch built this, uh, an R3A, with a working third cylinder when he was 16. Uh, and after spending however many countless hours, he always told us um, he decided that there were things he didn't like, so he tore it apart and rebuilt it and, and did it a second time. So, But he was uh, a master at scratch building uh, New Haven Steam. Uh, Bill Aldrich would be another one. Uh, and so the R3 was kind of the one that uh, was big for him. Here's a look at the three different, uh, you know, various appearances over the years as they move things around and added shields or not for this class of locomotives. Uh, but shoreline modelers, uh, you know, up through probably about 47, this is this is a key one. So passenger trains, um, 
for small passengers, the G4A um, uh, would have been a, a branch line one for a lot of them. Uh, this is a, you know, a very straightforward, not a lot of changes made to these over the years, with the exception of when they were rebuilt, the smoke box was extended. So this is the original configuration. And you can see how it's been extended out here. Um, so depending on what area you're modeling, you may need to make some modifications to the uh, Empire Midland model. Um, not all have arch windows. These were early locomotives um, like the K1s and so uh, and the T2s as well. So some of them had the arch windows, some did not. Uh, some the headlight was on the front, some was moved to the top. Uh, up here as well. Otherwise, it's just the same minor changes on these that would be made to like the, the J1s or the K1s where um, some modifications for the running board, uh, air pumps, swapping tenders, and that sort of thing. They, they did not have a lot of major changes. And while they're recognizably New Haven, they don't jump out at you like the L1s or the R1Bs with their uh, Alesco feed water heaters and, and the air pumps up front. So you can see, so these, um, the New Haven was slow to adopt stokers. In some cases they did it only because they uh, were forced to, um, it, but when they did add the stoker, they would extend the coal bunker sides to compensate for the lost coal capacity. Um, some cases, I, I think they did that just to, to increase capacity, even if it didn't receive a stoker. Um, but this is, you know, another example of modifications that they would make to the tenders over the years. Otherwise, these are pretty straightforward, simple locomotive, but uh, a lot of road numbers to choose from here if you're modeling it. Still with the boiler tube pilots on these. Uh, a lot of them had this railing going down across the front on the G4s. Uh, if you're modeling the east end, um, these would have been very common on the old colony lines. Um, the main passenger classes on the New Haven were the I classes. These locomotives, um, they're the I-1 class, there's no model available of it. I don't have any pictures in here of that. Uh, it's a similar light Pacific. Um, the I-2 class was kind of the standard branch line um, and also secondary mainline passenger trains. Uh, so for the non-named trains, uh, the I-2s were, were pretty common. And they uh, lasted up until the end of steam and did not receive a whole lot of modifications. They were uh, great just as they were. So, and they, they just lasted a long time. Very clean look on these. They did not receive the uh, modifications that the heavier classes did. This has ATS up on the pilot here for, uh, this is on Boston. So this would have been on the shoreline. This is one in freight service. We have photos of the I-2s and I-4s in freight service. Uh, so they did do have, and, and actually some engine assignments specifically for that. So it was not just an anomaly at times, they were used specifically in that service. So the I-4 is one of those signature New Haven locomotives. Um, Again, this is just, a, it, it really can't be anything else because of changes they made. The air tanks are moved up top here. When they did that, they found that the uh, it would suck smoke and steam underneath these and into the cabs. So they added uh, smoke deflectors to them. Uh, and of course, the feed water heater was an addition. Um, otherwise, you've got the, the arch cab windows. And these were kind of the signature... Uh, passenger locomotive until 1937. Uh, they had 50 of them and these were handling all of the name trains on the shoreline and the major uh, name trains on Springfield line. And one of those that they, uh, most people would identify as a uniquely New Haven locomotive. If you were asking about New Haven steam, this would be it. This is a tender off of a J1 locomotive. Um, and then it received stokers. Uh, and when they added the stoker, they added the coal bunker extension. It's got a lot of patches on the side here, it looks like. 
be an interesting locomotive to model. Different patches on this one, same tender. So this is an I-4F, and this hatch here is a for the Type E superheater. Uh, when they receive superheaters, a Type A or Type E, um, they would be different classes. So the Type A was an I-4E, Type E, uh, e superheater became an I-4F, and you can tell by those hatches uh, behind the smoke deflector there. ATS on this one again, there's a look at that patch as well. So 1357, this is interesting uh, sequence here that I can show you. So this is on the shoreline um, with the long haul tender, the W12C um, that was used for the shoreline. Um, then later on, uh, actually a year later, it looks like it's now gone back to a, a more standard tender for its size. Uh, and so this is in Cedar Hill, but it's, uh, doesn't have the ATS box on the front anymore. It doesn't look, uh, well, yeah, it may be hidden under there, but it doesn't look like it does. So this may not be running on the shoreline anymore. This could be used on um, some other service, uh, although it is sitting in Cedar Hill. So um, it could have the ATS box on the side as well. Uh, but this has the separate tender. And uh, at this point, it's an I, these are uh, an I4E class with the type A superheater. Uh, here it is again, but now it has uh, the W10C tender with the extended coal bunker, and it is now an I4F with the Type E superheater. Uh, it does have the ATS on the back, so it's probably hidden under there, and just the angle of the photo was hiding it, um, especially since that was Cedar Hill as well. Um, so this one is, you know, shows kind of the the evolution of the class, and this, of course, was the one I showed at the beginning. This is also the same 1357, uh, near the end of its life. Uh, this would have been its final configuration. Um, and I have photos of this in New Britain. So again, patches on the side, but your pretty standard uh, New Haven steam here. Uh, this is 1392. Or, um, I'm sorry, 1359 on the merchants uh, in 32 with the V1A tender. We don't have too many photos of these with the uh, the V1A, but that was what those tenders were um, initially purchased for. The There's been a long-standing story that says that they would derail on the slip switches in Boston, and so they didn't last very long. We've documented in photos five years of, of service, but they were purchased specifically so that they wouldn't have to make a water stop in New London uh, and therefore increase the time. And so I find it hard to believe that they would sometime after 33 remove those tenders before they received the long haul um, tenders in 37. So I think they ran with them for about a decade before they were replaced. I certainly don't doubt that they may have had problems with them, uh, but they probably just worked around it until they replaced them with the, uh, the longer tenders. It's a good shot of the W7A tender, the rear of a toolbox and all that. It's a real nice shot. Uh, it's not a, as common a, a perspective. So for modelers, uh, this is this is a real nice shot. Here it is in uh, freight service. Uh, this is in Berlin, which is just south of New Britain um, or westbound on the uh, on the Berlin line, I guess, uh, by railroad. Um, direction. And uh, this was on a freight that was both a through freight, Holyoke to Cedar Hill, but it served as the local freight north of Plainville, as well as serving as the local freight for Berlin itself. So here it is doing some switching moves in Berlin. Um, and again, we do have uh, records of them being assigned specifically to local freights uh, or through freights as opposed to uh, just passenger service. Nice shot of it there, though. Uh, in 47, it still has the uh, NE class wooden caboose as well. Here's 1383 in New Britain uh, on passenger service. So um, I, I mentioned earlier that the steam, uh, some of these classes you would see more common on the east end in the later years. So as, as diesels came on to the, uh, the property, they were assigned to the west end initially and the steam was pushed further east. And actually that continued as new diesels came on, the older diesels were pushed east. So if you're modeling 
uh, Rhode Island or the Boston area, Old Colony, that sort of thing. Um, you'll run steam there a lot longer. This was in March 48. By the end of 1948, there was no steam running through um, New Britain anymore. And the only reason this continued to use steam on this to the end of 48 was because the power was assigned in Boston. This one's been decorated up for the Yankee Clipper. It says YC on the front here, and they've you know, done some nice edging here along all the way, even along the tender. So. All right, and then the classic uh, New Haven loco that everybody knows, steam wise anyway, is the uh, the I five. Um, there were a few minor modifications made to these over the years, not many visible ones, um, since they were designed specifically as a streamlined locomotive. But to have easy access to maintenance, they didn't suffer the fate of a lot of other uh, streamlined equipment, where they would slowly remove some of the uh, the um, streamline covers and stuff so that they could get easier access to it. Uh, this was the original configuration. And there are a number of visible differences with the number of stripes on the pilot here, as you'll see in them and the, uh, the paint schemes as they go on. Um, some of them receive the little uh, script herald in the front here. This doesn't have a stripe on the bottom of the pilot like that other one did. Um, this is the second paint scheme uh, with the, Script Herald here, uh, it's already received it in 39. Very easy to model. A number of brass models have been released. And of course, BLI released it as a hybrid brass or brass model as well. Um, and you won't mistake it for anything else. It was a uh, unique locomotive. New Haven had 10 of them that they purchased in 1937, and they were all retired by well, at least by 52. I think by 1950, they were all off the roster. I kind of prefer this original uh, paint scheme myself with the New Haven spelled out. And I think we're running low on time, so we'll take questions here in just a second. Um, so this is the final scheme with the large script herald. And uh, so that's it. This one was set up for, uh, this is in pusher service. It's got an extra headlight on the back here instead of just the, the backup light. But uh, I'll minimize this so we can answer any questions. If folks have any questions, there's a lot of stuff in the handouts. Uh, hopefully I didn't go too quickly through this. Can you uh, give us your uh, blog location? Yes. So the website is newbritainstation.com. And that's Britain with a T-A-I-N. Uh, Britain, B R I T A I N dot okay. com. Um, I'll go right there. It is newbritainstation.com. Um, the blog is blog.newbritainstation.com, and that's where the handouts are here for you. Thank you. Um, actually, I probably have to share that screen because I think all you see is here. Let me uh, see how I do that. Uh, share a different screen. You want to see this one. So hopefully you can see it now. Um, that's the blog. Uh, but like I said, New Britain Station, there's lots of information about the New Haven Railroad, but also about just kind of my approach to modeling and philosophy and so on. And uh, the handouts are available here uh, for that. I don't see if any questions came up. I'm on the Facebook chat. I don't know if... Um... We have plenty of questions. Okay. Are there sure. some quick and dirty kit bash things you can do to model these? Uh, so the the major quick and dirty kit bash is the Bachman Light Mountain, USRA Light Mountain, into an R1B class. And there's two specific handouts in there that detail how to go through that process. Um, the, the primary handout is based on an, a brass engine, but you just substitute the, the Bachman engine for that has all the parts and stuff shown on that. Um, then the second one, is, and it wasn't showing up there, it's still sinking, I think, is a, uh, Ted Collada had put together a list of detailed parts and changes he was gonna make to the Bachman one to do the R1B. Um, the easiest one to do is the Y3 switchers, because that's just a, almost a straight USRA 080, and you can use any model for those. Um, 
You can use a Bachman. Uh, there's a class that I didn't feature here because there's not a readily available model, but the F5 class uh, can be based off of a Bachman uh, model as well. Um, otherwise, most of these you're going to start with brass, but they've gotten to be pretty reasonable with the amount of them on eBay and so on. What is the ATS box? Uh, automatic train stops. So on the shoreline and the Springfield line, the two main lines, uh, it's a signaling system that's in the cab. It's also called cab signal sometimes. So um, not only would you have the signals uh, in the uh, on the line, but if you passed a signal, you'd have the signal in front of you in the cab, and it would actually stop the train if you went through a, a signal uh incorrectly. And on the shoreline in particular, that was super important because there are a lot of drawbridges on the shoreline. Uh, um, okay. The shoreline is, it, the New Haven suffered from a problem because the longest run was from Boston to New York. And there's a lot of curves on the shoreline in addition to the drawbridges. Uh, they did get all the grade crossings elevated, but, uh, you know, it just, it, they you don't see the huge steam like the big boys or articulated like that because they had no use for it. They, they didn't have, um, they're, they're all very short runs and, uh, and really a, a question of acceleration more than uh, running at high speed constantly. Now, in the beginning of your slideshow, I noticed that as you go from one picture to the next one, the, the headlight in the front moves from the middle of the boiler to the top yep. and back to the middle. Is there a reason for uh, well, the reason it's the reason in the slideshow it's moving in back and forth is because the the pictures are not in chronological order; they're in order by road number. Um, so, a lot of times they move the headlight, I believe, to the top of it specifically to make it easier to service the locomotive. Because yeah. then, when you're opening the smoke box front, you don't have to worry about the headlight being in the way. Uh, it might have been also for. Uh, uh, visibility. I, I don't know if having it mounted higher helped, uh, you know, a longer throw, but uh, they they start for the ones that did move, they started in the front of the smoke box and then moved it to the top of the smoke box. Okay. So uh, on your uh, picture of the R3A, there's, yep. some, there's some big cylinder thing like where the, the top headlight was on the other other, other um, locos. What, what is yep. that? So the big cylinder is the Alesco feed water heater. So there's a number of different feed water heaters that uh, railroads use for steam locomotives. Normally what happens is you have water coming out of the tender that's essentially room temperature, okay? And you're trying to heat it up to boiling temperature and above. So the feed water heater is a bundle of uh, piping in there and there's there's pipes that have that come from the boiler that wrap around the, the pipes in there and it and it actually preheats the water before it then gets into the boiler. Oh, okay. Okay. So there's a there's a pump on the side of the locomotive that that is drawing uh, the water and pumping it into the feed water heater. And then the that heats the 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 um, the uh, the water so that it's going into the boiler at, at you know closer to boiling temperature already. My understanding is that the, the the benefit of that is for things like acceleration more than running at speed. Um, but that's, I, I'm, I'm not, a, there's certainly steam experts out there that understand how all of these appliances function and why they're there. Um, but those were primarily applied. If you look at the classes that the New Haven used them on, they were on the R classes. Um, and the I-4 class, as well as the L-1. So those are the ones that are, are running on the shoreline and have more starts and stops um, and need to be able to accelerate faster. Cool. So who were the companies building these beasts? Uh, most of the New Haven uh, was an Alco shop. Alco was the, the primary provider of steam for New Haven. Um, they had a a bidding war for the uh, I-5 class. So those were the only Baldwin built locomotives on the railroad. Um, and that is part of what gives the, the New Haven a particular, um, I don't know, a family appearance since the locomotives were built by Alco and then a lot of work done in the New Haven's own shops. Um, they do have a very similar look to them. Whereas some roads uh, that made a purchase from multiple builders would have had a, a number of different appearances uh, because of that. Cool. 
Well, Randy, thank you very, very much. That was quite informative. I'm not a steam modeler, but now you piqued my interest. Yeah. <laughs> Your time and thank you for putting all this effort in. So, and thank you guys for doing this. This is great fun. Uh, you know, Gordy and you and the crew and stuff are, are doing a great job making this work for us. And uh, I've got an operations one that I'm planning on doing on the 13th the next time. So uh, I hope to see everybody there. Thank you much. Stay safe. Thanks, you too.